Hi, everybody. Greetings to you, wherever you are in the world watching this. I am coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today. I particularly want to thank Dr. Heidi Larson and Clarissa Simmis and everyone at the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm very, very honored to be speaking to this group of uh, scientists and scholars and responders and caregivers today, and I'm really happy to be speaking with a bunch of fellow Canadians. It's been a, a really good uh, week for um, uh, vaccines uh, in relation to COVID-19. We saw that um, Pfizer released news that uh, their vaccine is uh, over 90% effective in, uh, in the latest trials. Um, and so today, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about the role of emotions, um, both actually in, in terms of who is likely to get infected upon exposure to a virus, and also um, potentially who is most likely to benefit um, from the vaccines um, when they are available. Uh, I only have, you know, uh, 10 minutes, so I'm going to really um, take this at a pretty quick clip and I'm going to just um, try to hit some high notes uh, and then give you some resources um, that you can follow up on uh, if you're interested at the end of the talk. So the first question really um, that I want to address and maybe the question for the entire talk is who develops respiratory illness upon exposure to a virus? Everybody? Most people? Only some people? Well, it turns out we know something a bit about this a bit because uh, there was a, a set of studies performed if between 1986 and 2011 by, led by the psychologist Sheldon Cohen. This was called the Common Cold Project. And it was a series of prospective viral challenge studies that were conducted um, out in the world. Dr. Cohen and his colleagues placed viruses into the noses of healthy people including a coronavirus that is linked to the common cold. And he and his colleagues observed who developed respiratory infections um, upon exposure. In five studies, between 20 and 40% of the people who were exposed developed illness. That means at least 60% of people who were exposed to the virus did not develop respiratory symptoms. And this indicates that a virus is not a sufficient cause of illness. Chronic stress, emotion, social isolation, social and economic disadvantage, childhood adversity, and other psychosocial factors seemed to confer risk, social integration, social support, positive emotions, and high quality relationships with parents in childhood seemed to confer resilience. You know, it's tempting to assume that a virus is the major cause of respiratory illness, that a virus works kind of like a mechanistic system infecting the body in this very, very um, mechanistic way, and that any psychosocial factors are subsidiary and merely moderate the virus's impact. After all, you know, you can't develop uh, respiratory illness without a virus. But a virus is not the cause because, as we saw, only between 20 and 40 percent of people across these studies develop respiratory illness, respiratory infection upon exposure. So respiratory infections, like most bi biological phenomena, most likely emerge from a complex web of weak interdependent causal factors. That is, it's a complex system that you're, the virus and the body uh, and uh, the brain are a complex system. A virus doesn't merely replicate itself from its genes in a passive human body. It has the capacity to cause infection um, only when um, the body's cells and immune system and brain are in certain conditions. So basically, the biological state of the host is also a necessary condition for illness. The ensemble of brain plus body provides a necessary environment for a virus to develop and in, uh, cause an infection. The human brain plus the state of the human body contributes basically to the likelihood of its own infection, 
in part by the mental phenomena that it creates, which in turn are linked to immune and metabolic function. So in a very real way, the probability and severity of infection at any given moment, as well as the resilience, that is exposure to a virus but with no symptoms, is actually a unique confluence of a virus in a body with a thinking, feeling, and perceiving brain. So both the virus and the brain plus body work together in a sense as a complex system. Um, neither one is a sufficient cause. Neither one should be ignored in science or in practice. And so in this view, psychological factors, including emotions, may be actually thought of as necessary causes of respiratory illness. They're not sufficient to develop respiratory illness, but then neither is a virus. To understand a little bit about how this works, we have to take your brain's perspective. So for your whole life, your brain is entombed in a dark, silent box called your skull. It learns what is going on around in the world only via, indirectly via scraps of information from the sensory channels of your body, like sights and sounds and smells and so on. These sensory changes are the outcomes of things that are happening in the world. They are the effects of things happening in the world. Your brain has to figure out what caused these sensory inputs so that it knows how to act to keep you alive and well. But there's a tricky bit. The sensory information can be noisy, ambiguous, and incomplete. And any given sensory input, like say a flash of light or a very loud bang, can have many different causes. So consider a loud bang. That could be someone dropping something on the floor. It could be someone slamming a door. It could be one car hitting another car in front of your house. Um, it could even be a gunshot if you live in the United States. Um, and in much in the same way, your brain also has to make sense of sensory changes that are coming from your body. So for example, an ache in your gut could be hunger. It could be anxiety. It could be a uh, uh, gut feeling that a uh, defendant can't be trusted if you happen to be in a courtroom. Similarly, an ache in your chest, a pull and tighten in, tightening in your chest could be uh, anxiety. It could be um, that, uh, you know, uh, having difficulty breathing because uh, of uh, running up the stairs or um, having exercised uh, or uh, in coming close to your ventilatory load or um, because you're starting to develop respiratory symptoms or even the beginnings um, of, of a heart attack. So your brain has to determine the causes of sensations when all it has access to are the outcomes or the effects. This is what scientists and philosophers call a reverse inference problem. How does your brain solve this reverse inference problem? Well, it has one more source of information, your past experiences. Your brain is basically constantly remembering past experiences that are similar in some way to the present, to what is going on around you right now and in your body. So what is similar to the present conditions. So your brain, figuratively speaking, is not asking, what are these sensations? They're, it's asking, what are these similar to? Now in psychology, a group of things which are similar are called a category. So in a sense, what your brain is doing is it's using past experiences to dynamically create categories on the fly. It's bringing past experience to bear as knowledge to reinstate patterns that are similar to the present. So the brain is remembering. So it's not a conscious experience of remembering. Basically, your brain is reinstating these patterns from your past often in novel ways, which we call generativity, to um, create representations um, that are similar to the present conditions as a way of guessing at the causes of sensations in order to uh, make a plan um, to do something about them. So what you would do when you have an ache in your gut, whether you would eat, whether you would ask for help, um, whether you would um, uh, find somebody guilty, um, all depend on how your brain makes sense um, of those sensations. Similarly, what you do when you have an ache in your chest um, depends on how your brain is making sense of your sensations. So you could say that 
each category that your brain makes in each moment is actually a population of possibilities, a population of opportunities, a population of, um, uh, of um, guesses about what to do next um, based on the current situation. In this way, emotions are not, emotions are, are made, they're not, um, emotions are built um, as you need them. They're not built into your brains. Um, they're not reactions to the world. They're your brain's constructions of the world, or rather a better way to say it is they're your brain's understanding of what is going on inside your own body in relation to what is happening in the world. Categorizing, creating categories to make sense of what is going on inside your own body like an ache in relation to what is happening in the world so your brain can figure out what to do next to keep you alive and well. And in a very real way, variation is the norm because the, every time your brain is making a category as a way of explaining sense data in order to act on it, your brain is creating a whole set of opportunities or possibilities or possible futures. And each time your brain creates a category, it may not look like uh, it, any other time. So um, when your brain makes a category for anger in one situation, that may look very different than the category that it makes um, for anger in another situation or for fear or any other emotion category that your brain is capable of making. So emotion categories, just like people who are developing respiratory illnesses or not, are populations of variable instances. And in fact, um, this was a concept that Darwin introduced in On the Origin of Species and that the biologist Ernst Mayer calls population thinking. So the big takeaways here are, first, that when it comes to brains and bodies, whether we're talking about emotion or we're talking about who gets sick uh, by exposure to a virus, variation is the norm. The common cold studies show really clearly um, that um, a, you know, the mind and the body are linked, not in some vague metaphorical way, but in a real probabilistic biological way. What we think, what we feel, how we experience the world, and who we experience it with translates into vulnerabilities or resilience to illness. We don't really know how mental events like the experience of fear or anger or awe or gratitude are transformed into physical conditions like immune function. But so this is something that scientists are working on and maybe even some of you are working on. And I guess the, the thought that I would leave you with is an absence of knowing everything is not the same as knowing nothing. The Common Cold Project clearly suggests that at least for cold viruses, one of which was a coronavirus, and so this may generalize to other viruses too, like COVID-19, that psychosocial factors uh, leave a brain more or less able to regulate the pro-inflammatory cytokine response upon exposure to a virus. Other research has established a relationship between other biological conditions and stress and emotion that are really important. So for example, um, people who are chronically stressed have shorter telomere lengths. And this increases pro-inflammatory, uh, chronic stress increases pro-inflammatory cytokines and also encourages a poorer antibody response to vaccines. And people with shorter telomeres, particularly in white blood cells that help mount an immune response to pathogens, have an increased risk in respiratory illness. Now, if you want to find out more about these ideas, which some of which I know sound pretty outrageous to you, um, but I can tell you that they're based on the best available science um, that uh, certainly that I know about, you can um, look at my book, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. Um, and as well, um, for a fuller discussion of these ideas and the science behind them, you can look at my new book, uh, which comes out next week, uh, November 17th, called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be with you in person, well, virtually in person um, today, but if anyone would like to reach out to me, please email me at uh, l.barrett at 
northeastern.edu. If you Google my name, you can find the, the email address easily. Thank you again for listening to my talk, and I hope the rest of this conference is informative and useful to you.